When I was seven or eight years old, I was awakened at 5 a.m. one morning to a loud bang. That loud bang was federal agents kicking down my door looking for a family member of mine who was a big time drug dealer at the time. He wasn't there, it was just me, my mom, and my sister. I can still remember the fear, the confusion, and the traumatic impact that that event had on me. That event stole my sense of security. I didn't feel safe in my own home. They threatened to come to my school and take me away from my parents, so I didn't feel safe there. And lastly, it shaped my perception of police and law enforcement. I now looked at them as the enemy. Like in many other local communities, growing up in the city of Boston, you had more liquor stores than grocery stores, more drug dealers than college graduates, and more funerals than weddings. Most who believe that behavior is learned. And I can honestly say that was the case for me. I became what I seen every day. I became a product of my environment. If you were to walk through a low-income community and take a poll and ask um, individuals, or even go inside prisons and ask them, when you were younger, what did you want to grow up and be? I can guarantee you, almost not, none of them would say, I want to grow up and be a gangbanger, or a drug dealer, or a robber. It used to be, I want to be a superhero, or a police officer, or a firefighter. So where did that shift happen? I believe the conditions of poverty helped create that shift. Aristotle offers a quote and says, poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. And I believe that to be true. Being a student in, in middle school in Boston public school system was pretty rough. The school looked more like a prison than a school. We had 40 students in one class. We had one book for every three students. I remember spending most of my time in the hallways running around not engaging in any type of material. And then I remember being at my middle school graduation and thinking, how did I even get here? I don't deserve this. I didn't work for it. And at that moment, I realized they don't care about me. They're pushing me out. So as, if, if matters couldn't get even worse, it was in eighth grade when I lost my first friend to street violence. Darkeem Galloway, seventh grade, shot in his head because he didn't want to give up his hat to some of the local game bangers in the neighborhood. This happened just blocks away from my school. So now I wasn't being engaged. I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel like anyone cared. So I said to hell with it. That led me on to getting suspended, missing days of school, and then eventually getting introduced to the juvenile justice system for truancy. That apathetic attitude poured over into high school, and I eventually got kicked out of three different high schools and written off by society. And I remember on my last trial thinking, how did they kick me out? They're the ones that failed me. They failed to provide a safe space. They failed to provide caring adults to make me feel like a student and not a number. And they failed to provide a challenging curriculum to keep me engaged. But yet, I'm the bad guy. So, as a direct result of being disengaged for roughly two or three years, I caught myself in a vicious cycle. I turned to the streets. I felt like I had no other option at the time. I didn't consider myself a criminal. I consider myself a survivor. In that two year period, I couldn't find a job. So I started selling drugs, got arrested, started getting into fights, getting jumped, watching my friends get gunned down in the streets. And I myself came face to face with death on three different occasions. I was knee deep in the game, quote unquote. But then one day, there was a huge sweep in Brockton. They arrested over 20 individuals for drugs in the city. They were all my friends. And I thought, Sean, you're next. And that very same day, I turned the corner on my street, and there was a police cruiser right in front of my house with their lights on. 
When I seen that, I immediately went back to being eight years old and remembering those federal agents kicking down my door. It was then that I said to myself, this is not about you anymore. This is about your family. I couldn't put my sister and my mother through that again. So at that point, I said, you got you to gotta make a change. So I went on to look for a second chance. It wasn't easy. I found my second chance at an organization called Youth Build. Youth Build is a comprehensive program for youth who have dropped out of high school and are unemployed. And while they're in the program, they get to work, they spend half of their time working towards their GED or high school diploma, and the other half gaining marketable job skills, building low-income homes for low-income families. There are social and emotional components of the model and also chances to develop leadership skills which has helped lead me to the stage today to represent thousands and thousands of UFIL students in local communities across the U.S. and now in 15 countries across the globe. When the education system failed me, when the job market failed me, when the justice system failed me, Youth Bill was there to welcome me with open arms. I first heard about the program from a cousin of mine who graduated. My initial uh, my initial intentions of the program was to join the program, get my GED, pick up a certificate and a trade, and be on my way. But boy, did the staff did have plans for me. They said, LaShawn, we respect your decision, but why don't you give college a shot? Don't say it's not for you unless you give it a shot. Hey, we'll pay for it. We'll bring you to the class. You know, if it doesn't work, what's the loss to you? So I took them up on their offer. So immediately after completing the program, I enrolled in the Bridge Program, which was in a partnership between youth, my local youth field program and the local community college. And that was my first college class, and I passed it with the A. Receiving that grade motivated me to want to go on immediately full time in the next semester. And so I did so. And I kept up the pace and eventually ended up completing my associates in criminal justice with high honors inducted into three honor societies, and made dean's list every single semester. Thank you. Now, this picture is significant to me because this is me and my father at my graduation. Now, this will be the last time I'll see my father because he was murdered three weeks after that. That was one of the most trying and darkest times of my life. I wanted to give up on everything, education, you name it, I wasn't for it. And even though I was two years out of the program, the youth field staff was still there for me. They served as my counselors. They came to my house unannounced to make sure I was okay. And lastly, and most importantly, they reminded me that the last thing my father would want was for me to give up on my education. So I internalized that and kept up the pace. And this May, I just completed my, my bachelor's at UMass Boston. And now I'm on my way to Northeastern University for uh, my master's in nonprofit management. Now, while I appreciate all the accomplishments and all the opportunities, every time I come to DC or go to any other city and I go back to my community, it's a smack in the face. My people are still in the struggle. There are over 6.7 million opportunity youth who are unemployed and have no education. In addition, there are over 2.3 million individuals in our prison systems. What if they had a second chance? Would the world be a better place? My answer is yes, and it's not too late. But we have to all work to collectively to help change the conditions and help provide more opportunity for the millions of youth in America. So the question is how? How can we do that? I have three solutions for you. My first solution is, instead of making decisions for them, give youth and members of the community a voice. They are the experts. They're the ones living in, in these situations. A perfect example would be the National Council of Young Leaders, Opportunity Youth United, on which I represent you for USA on. We put together a set of recommendations to increase opportunity and decrease poverty in America. Some of our priorities are to increase 
uh, comprehensive programs like Youth Build and reform the criminal justice system and many more. But again, these recommendations were all produced by former opportunity youth themselves. Secondly, let's, instead of investing more in jails and building more jails, let's invest in more youth build programs so that every youth who wants a second chance can have the opportunity to and take seeds of it, where they could earn the high school diploma or GED with relevant curriculum and opportunities for service learning where they can gain job training and become community assets instead of liabilities, where they have the access to caring adults to help them work through life's challenges and build their resilience to transform their lives, where they can engage in community service for communities that they may have damaged before, but now they can then go back and build a connection. And lastly, give them leadership skills and the tools to take responsibility and advocate for change in their community, in their lives, in this nation, and in the world. Lastly, let's look at some of the policies that are preventing these men and women from reaching their full potential, such as the regulations around criminal records and the school discipline policies, so that we can have less of these and more of these. Now that is a simple formula, and I believe that that formula will change lives and open many doors. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my story. I thank you for listening.